Hi, I'm Dorian Aiken, and I'm here to talk to you today about resistance to change. A little bit about my background. I have a doctorate in coaching. I teach on the MPhil coaching um, masters here at USB, and I teach on your leadership course. I coach, I lecture, I facilitate, and I do talks like the one we're going to listen to today. Resistance to change is the topic. It's a multi-perspectival lens on resistance to change and um, what we can try to do to limit resistance. Resistance to change, and I said a multi-headed hydra. Do you know what the hydra is? Ancient Greek monster. From every time you cut off one head, another head grows. And that's my metaphor for resistance to change. Yeah, I want to talk about the fact that resistance to change is actually a physiological condition that we have because of our, the way our brain works. Okay, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But it's also a consequence of worldviews, competing, clashing worldviews. And it's a consequence of the fact that we are still evolving. And then I want to talk about the um, resistance to change at different levels in organizations. <coughs> Finally, I want to give you an insight or a couple of tools on what we can do differently. So I'm just going to show you the piece of the brain that's so important when it comes to change. It's in the limbic brain. Your implicit memory is informing while you're still in the womb because of limbic resonance. Why does that matter to us? Our limbic brains are resonating right now. And our limbic brains will go to fight or flight in under a fifth of a second. That's its default norm. From the moment we are born, we are putting together patterns of learning. And those patterns of learning get stored eventually in our implicit memory. And even more, when we have a lot of data, like how to drive a car or um, something physical that you do every day. So the less mindfulness, the less consciousness we have of what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, what I'm doing, the more likely you behave from an, a, a sort of knee-jerk reaction to things. So that's the next emerging piece, is consciousness is terribly, terribly important. So tell me something, who's experienced bias remorse? <laughs> You've moved house and you think, why on earth did we do this? So bias remorse, that has a lot to do with resistance to change because the brain seeks certainty. So the brain gets alarmed when we don't have certainty. And you, as you know, in organizations where you have retrenchments, where you have uh, mergers and acquisitions, where you have systems shifting around and changing, new leaders, new managers, there's a lot of anxiety around uncertainty. <coughs> so that's another condition of resistance to change. And when we're not given certainty, it touches a lot of other triggers in our brains. But we do have plasticity. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword because you can change your patterns in, in your brain. There are basically just three basal paradigm questions. How did we get here? Why are we here? And what do we need to do now that we are here? I just want to tell you a little bit about what integral theory is. It's a lens, a multifocused lens for opening up meaning from many disciplines. It believes that there has been, and there's a lot of evidence for this now building up, a historic series of transformations through several distinct stages of consciousness. So the, each stage is more complex than the next. No stage drops away. They are all there simultaneously. And that's, if you like, our crisis around resistance to change and our crisis as, as, as the human race today because there's more depth, less span, as you go, as you go up, this, or as, as time goes by and these new civilizations emerge. And each one of them have profound belief systems, and the belief systems depend very much on what is known, what you can prove. 
Integral then, as a theory, has a big picture view. It has a greater capacity for perspective. Its mantra is true but partial. And the final important piece around an integral emergence or transpersonal emergence is a regrowth of spirit. The quality of your spiritual beliefs, you know, what is important to me in my journey through life is another way of putting that, is really important. Every situation, every, every evolution, civilization has its rise and its fall. Because if you look at this picture, the Bruce Lipton picture, and we're still emerging, he talks about holism, Integral talks about global tribe, that actually we're reinventing tribe, not going back to what tribe was when it was splintered and still is in different parts of the world, but that as a, a humanity, we recognize that we're part of a global tribe. That's a different level of consciousness, different level of accountability and personal responsibility. So when we talk about changes in organizations as well. So the, each one of these stages has its light and its shadow. Okay? So a, a company or an organization or a group of people operating at pre-conventional, the shadow side of them is, res is deep resistance to change. At the conventional stages, and a lot of you will recognize this, you can have compliant organizations. Sustainability is seen as, an, as sort of an imposition. Efficient organizations at the conventional level, they value sustainability as a source of staying strong. Then what is called post-conventional -post or transpersonal in organizations, the organizations recognize the role and the interplay that they have globally. So resistance to change at the uh, level, the low end of the spectrum of consciousness is very stuck in one pattern of doing things. What can we do about resistance to change? I think you get the picture now that each level of development carries its own belief systems. And each level also has been dependent on what was known of the world, what, was, what we could actually know. There's still a lot of resistance to change in our organizations around any of this stuff that I'm sharing with you this morning. We have never experienced a more demanding or fast-paced and complex leadership environment. There are unprecedented challenges for leadership and its capacity and delivery, and we know that most leaders are in over their heads. So what can we do to help? New science of what's called vertical learning. If you just take one line of development, let's say that's the line of emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence and in integral theory is simply about care and concern. And at the low end of emotional intelligence, which we all have to start at, the care and concern is about me. <laughs> then a child progresses, and at a certain point, the child becomes sociocentric, aware of me and my tribe. And then as we go up in terms of our own development, we hope that we become world-centric in our line of care and concern. That, in terms of care and concern, would mean sitting down with me, my tribe, and my enemies with care and concern. And you can see how limited that is still across the world. Recently, Ken Wilber, who's really responsible for popularizing integral thought, described this development of the human race across the globe as ladders with climbers and views. So if you're on a ladder at rung, rung one, you can only see what you can see from that rung. And this is a problem for resistance to change. If you're dealing with a tribal view of the world, which is me and my tribe and the rest of you can go to hell, yeah, how do you deal with resistance to change? And tribe, because of where it's standing on the ladder, will only see tribe values. Simply in the, the energy and the effort that they placed on maintaining the rules and on strong leadership. Yeah? So strong leadership has its light and its shadow. It can be tyrannical or it can be for the good of the tribe. And then 
emerging from um, egocentric power guards, we go into a, a more authoritarian, more structured society, which is still with us. Most of our corporates are structured like that. It's hierarchical. Let's have a set of rules, not just for my tribe or your tribe, but let's have governance for all of us, all the tribes. Firstly, we've got to recognize where people are on that ladder and how to approach that. And, and secondly, if we don't understand more about a transpersonal universe, we are closing the gap around our ability to survive as a human race. Not that many scientists are very upset about it. When you get law and order and hierarchies and everybody understanding the system, you also get a lot of rigidity. So then you get someone like Bill Gates or, um, yeah, Branson saying, I understand the rules, I understand the necessity for them, but if we just tweak the rules a bit, if I could tweak the rules a bit, we could make a killing. And that's what Spiral calls orange, the enterprise level, entrepreneur. The shadow of orange is greed. Now, up till that dotted line, the problem at each stage of development is the stage beneath it doesn't see what's above it, can't value it. And when we move into green consciousness at the humanistic level, that's what we're moving towards, a, more sense of, of a greater sense of connection. So at green level, that thinking has been responsible for fighting for women's rights, fighting for children's rights, indigenous people's rights. There's a much greater sense of connectedness. But green has its own rules and its own values. So that is the problem up to that dotted line. That at each level of the rung on that ladder, there's a lot of intolerance to the positions below and a lot of misunderstanding, just not seeing the positions above. Transpersonal sees the whole ladder. Transpersonal is able to say, I'm not going to be married to this point of view. I'm going to find a way to connect with and understand what other groups value and try to work from that position. What emerges after integrative and neo-tribal, we don't know. But what we do know is it's still going on. When the answers to questions change, civilization changes. The forms of resistance change. What can we do about it? We know that the actions we take depend entirely on the quality of the thinking we do first. The quality of our thinking depends on how we're feeling. If we're feeling bad, we can't think well. And there's a physiological reason for that. The way we feel affects our ability to think well and therefore to act on our potential, and now we've got the evidence to prove it. In order to advance our consciousness and understand resistance to change, we need to give people the opportunity to think well. We need to take personal responsibility for what we want to do to increase our own circle of influence and awareness. Those are some of the ways, that's the most powerful way that I can think of that has had the biggest impact on resistance to change, is give people the attention that they need in order to be able to change perception, rather than shut people down or be directive. You know, we started off with the fact that in our limbic brain, we are conditioned to make assumptions. We are conditioned to have um, a reaction in under a fifth of a second, a fight or flight reaction. We have stored memories that could be very wrong. We jump to conclusions that may not be correct, and that's part of our brain-based behavior, but when we know this, we can intervene in it. We can have mindfulness, and that is a practice. And then, Apart from our brain structure and the fact that we need to have that mindful awareness, we've got to take into account the movement of civilization and the belief systems at each stage and know how to meet them well. And perhaps then, all of us will try to squeeze through that narrow gap that some scientists are talking about and humanity can carry on. Mm -hmm.